KCI, thanks for joining us online tonight. Um, tonight's going to be a little bit different um, in the heat of what's going on in our world uh, currently. Um, Lucas, Ari, and I, we felt that it'd be best if we switch up our worship set tonight um, because we know that you guys probably are, you guys are probably have a lot on your heart. There's a lot of weight. Um, there's a lot of burden. You guys are frustrated. You guys are sad, angry, and that's a totally okay. We're human. Um, but tonight I encourage you to just leave it at the feet of Jesus. Um, we're going to sing a song. We're going to open up with the blessing because we just want to sing that over your lives tonight and then continue on with the service. Um, but I pray that tonight would speak to you and that God would reveal things to you and that if you just open up and just allow God to do what he does best, take dead situations and turn them alive again, that you would see that he's a miracle working God and that he can revitalize anything that's in his way. So come on, wherever you're at tonight, would you just begin to press in? God, we thank you for who you are, Lord. You are our sustainer. You're our rock. Lord, we can come to you regardless of the condition of our hearts, God. And you can make it beautiful again, God. You can take ugly situations, oh God, and you can make them beautiful again. So Lord, we come to you tonight, united as one body, Lord regardless of color, regardless of background. God, we come to you as one people tonight, Lord, pressing in, wanting a touch from you, Lord. We thank you for who you are and what you're going to do. It's in your matchless name that we pray these things. Amen. this night we sing the Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and give peace come all together we sing the Lord bless you church we sing. Oh uh -huh. 
children and their children may favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children
cross And you have won me With your kindness Chase me down I was lost Where would I be If it wasn't for the cross Hallelujah Thank you Jesus I was a prisoner Now I'm not With your blood
you love You give us life And you give us breath to breathe Thank you, Jesus Still stands. Great is your faithfulness. 
What's up, CI? How you guys doing tonight? I'm so excited to be here and to share this word with you. I know that God has something special in store for all of us. Now, I know that some of you are familiar with me and some of you are unfamiliar. For those of you who don't know me, my name is David. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. And for the last couple years, while I was working on my master's, I interned here at the Counterfluence under Pastor Clark. When I finished my master's, I ended up moving back to New York but apparently God had other plans. About three or four weeks ago, I moved back to Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm so excited to be here. Pastor Clark, Pastor Kim, I'm so grateful and thankful that you guys have given me this opportunity to share this word. I don't take your trust lightly, and I hope that when you guys see this video, you think that I was a good steward of this opportunity. On a more serious note, before I jump into my sermon, I think it is very important for me to spend a few moments talking about what's been going on in the world around us. We have seen on the news and on social media the senseless killings of both George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery. Seeing these things on the news has left many of us, including myself, feeling hurt, disappointed, hopeless, and straight up angry. I want you to know that for those of you who are feeling these emotions, that you are not alone. We are here with you, we see you, we mourn with you. And I want you guys to know that we care about what you're feeling. And more importantly, I know that Pastor Clark has a very powerful word prepared for next week where he's going to walk us all through the process of dealing with this. So please, please, if you don't hear anything else I say tonight, tune in next week to hear Pastor Clark's sermon. I know it's gonna be a powerful and healing moment. Now, before I jump into my sermon, I'm gonna spend a few moments praying about what's been going on. So I hope that you will join with me as I pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much, oh God, for this opportunity and for this moment, Lord. God, I know that it's so easy to look at the world around us, oh God, and feel hopeless and feel hurt and broken. But God, we know that you are in control, that you are in charge, that even in the midst of this mess, oh God, you have the ability, oh God, to transform and change lives, Lord. For those of us out there who are struggling to process what's going on, who are feeling hurt and angry, Lord Jesus, I pray that even right now that you minister to us, oh God, that we will see that it is not hopeless, that in you there is always hope and a chance for healing and reconciliation to come. And dear God, may we be bold enough as Christians, oh God, to stand up for justice, oh God, to speak out against oppression and, and injustice, Lord. So dear God, be with us and cover us and be with the families, oh God, of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and all the others who have lost their lives in the senseless killings. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now tonight, I'm going to be coming to you from 1 Kings chapter 17. So if you want to follow along, you can hop in the Bible tab and read along with me. I'll be reading from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. Let's read. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, Depart from here 
and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. I'd like to know where I can sign up for that meal plan. And he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Let's pray. Dear God, I know that I'm not capable of my own strength, O oh God, to deliver this word, Lord. I pray that your Holy Spirit will just fill me up, Lord, and speak through me, Lord. Get David out the way so that every word that I speak, O oh God, will come straight from you. And so that these kids and everyone else who is listening, Lord God, will hear only your voice. Bless me and cover me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 17, we meet Elijah the prophet. However, before we jump into his story, I think it is very important that we set the stage and the scene for what's going on in the life of Elijah. In the previous chapter, 1 Kings chapter 16, we see the nation of Israel going through a time of upheaval and fracture and confusion. There are constantly about four or five kings who come into power, lose power, come into power, lose power, until finally at the end of the chapter, we come across King Ahab. For those of you unfamiliar with the Old Testament or the Bible in general, King Ahab ends up being one of the most cruel and ruthless kings that the nation of Israel has ever seen. And what I think is so interesting about this passage is that there are a lot of parallels between what's going on in the land of Israel in 1 Kings chapter 16 and what's happening in our world today. Much like that world, we find ourselves in a place where there's distrust of our leadership, People are divided, people are fractured. There was a lot of tension happening between different people groups. But God ha always has a plan and he is getting ready to send Elijah to minister to this broken and hurt and divided land. And so 1 Kings chapter 17 opens with Elijah declaring a famine. And this brought out an interesting comparison to me because in 2020, we find ourselves experiencing a pandemic. And much like this famine in 1 Kings chapter 17, I believe this pandemic, while it's horrible and it has taken a lot of lives, it has also provided us with an opportunity to take a good look at ourselves and the world around us. And this famine that we see in Elijah 17 was doing the same thing for the land of Israel. Now, we finally come across this prophet Elijah. This is actually the first time we even meet Elijah in the Bible. This is his debut. Now, as I'm thinking about a prophet coming onto the scene, I would think his debut might be a little ceremony at the temple, maybe sacrifice a few bulls and keep it pushing. But God had other plans in play. He actually commands Elijah to go to Ahab and declare that there's going to be a famine in the land. Now, this is where things get really interesting. After God uses Elijah to declare this famine, he sends him to the east of Jordan. Now, if you study the geography of ancient Israel, you see that the, east, that the area east of Jordan is defined by desert and wilderness. Why would God have Elijah declare a famine and then go to a place that is already desolate? You know, in, in Genesis, we see Joseph encounter a similar situation where he predicts a famine, but at least God gave him a couple years to plan, to save up grain, to get things together. In this story, he just says, Elijah, famine, now go to the wilderness. This brings up a very interesting point. God's instructions may not always make sense, but he always knows what he's doing. I think it is so easy as Christians or as humans to say, God, I don't know where I'm going. It's dark. I can't see. So I got to try to figure this thing out on my, on my own. Now, when I was living here in Massachusetts previously, I lived up in the Hamilton Wenham area. Those of you who haven't really driven over there, especially when you get up near my school, Gordon Conwell, Gordon College, there's about one street light for every five miles. That road is defined by a lot of darkness. And when you're driving, the area at the end of your headlights, you can't see 
anything past that. And so you don't know what's coming around a bend. You don't know if a deer is about to pop up on you, if another animal is about to hop up on you. And so we see that this headlight can only see up to a certain distance. And in many ways, seeing a little bit of light can be worse than being completely dark. Because when we try to see things for ourselves, we may end up going somewhere we're not supposed to be. But when we stay, take a step back and allow God to be the one to guide us when we're not sure what to do, we always find ourselves exactly where he's called us to be and exactly where he needs us to be. Now, don't miss this next point. Elijah has just declared a famine. Now he's being sent to the wilderness. There exist these moments and these seasons that come between your struggle and your destiny. God was about to make Elijah's name great in all the world and in all of Israel. He was going to use him to combat the evil and injustice that we, were gonna, that we are going to see under the rule of King Ahab. But before he could step into this big and kind of scary destiny, God had to send him to the wilderness. Now, this time can feel like a wasted season. Like, God, I'm on a mission. I got things to do. Why are you hiding me away in the wilderness? But it's because God had to minister to Elijah and to give him this moment of, of separation and hiddenness before he could be launched to do what God had commanded him to do. And God is not one to leave his children hanging because when he sends Elijah into this area of desolation, he sends him to a brook and he provides him with ravens that are going to feed him. Now, this is a real, real, real good point right here because in verse number four, God says, you shall drink from the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you where? Feed you there. He was very specific about the location that Elijah had to be in order to receive food from the ravens. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but ravens got wings. That means they can pretty much fly and go wherever they want. So in my eyes, Elijah could have just went wherever he needed to go and the ravens could have met him. But God commanded him to go to a very specific place. He sent him to a designated location. This has a very big point of application for us. I know that some of us, we find ourselves like Elijah in this place of wilderness, in this place of desert, wondering, God, where are you? What are you doing in this season? I feel like I'm not hearing from you. I'm not connected to you. But I would challenge you and say, maybe the reason why you're feeling so empty, the reason why you're feeling like you're trapped in this place is because you're not where God has commanded you to be. Elijah was obedient, and because he was obedient and went to where God commanded him to be, he was able to receive the water from the brook and the food from the ravens. When you're not where God has positioned you, you find yourself in a place of lack. And it is not until you recognize that, God, I need to be where you called me to be in order to receive from you, then watch how things begin to change. Because this season that was supposed to be a dry and dusty season, ends up being a place where God ministers to you and God restores you. God turned this place of desolation into a place of restoration for Elijah. He brought healing out of hopelessness and he brought transformation out of trauma. So when you find yourself wondering and wondering, God, what is going on? Check the position of your heart. Check to see if you are in the place where God has called you to be, that place where you are on your knees crying out to him. Because that is, the o that is the only place where you can receive from him. But this wilderness time is only the beginning of Elijah's story. He was not meant to stay hidden in the wilderness forever. At the very last verse, in verse 7, it says, And after a while the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. 1 Kings chapter 17, I only read the first seven verses, but there's 24 verses total in this chapter. After the brook runs dry, Elijah launches out. The rest of the verses in that chapter, we see Elijah going forth and putting into action what God commanded him to do. We see him putting in work and going out to do all that he needs to. Let me break it down a little further for you. 
after Elijah leaves the wilderness, he heads to a region called Sidon. Now, in ancient times, this area of Sidon was ruled by this god called Baal. Now, Baal was the god of fertility, the god of the weather, the god of death. And he was in supposedly in control of this area. But in the story following right after, Elijah shows up to Sidon, and there's famine in that land too. So this Baal, who supposedly is in control of the weather, had to bow before our great God, who dried up the rain and stopped it from falling. And we see that God had no respect for this lesser God. We see that when it came to a comparison between Baal and God, he held no weight. All these things that he was supposedly in charge of, God immediately took power over him. Now, this is a big point about what God is capable of doing. I believe that God is in the business of tearing down strongholds and showing himself strong in places where he supposedly shouldn't be. Elijah was heading into foreign territory. He was headed into a place where God had not previously been the ruler. But when he was obedient, when he went forth, we saw God work miracle after miracle through him. In the following verses, we see God feed the widow. We see him raise the widow's son back to life, clearly showing that he is in control of the seasons. He's in control of the food. He's in control of life and death. This is the God who we serve. And there is nothing that is greater than him. But don't miss this point. God is always in the business of working through us as humans. It took the boldness of Elijah to go into this land and allow himself to be a conduit for the power of God. That's when the strongholds in Sidon started happening. That's when the miracles in Sidon started happening. It was when Elijah was willing to be obedient. And so I believe that God is going to raise up a generation of Elijah's who are not going to be afraid to go into the Sidons of the world and be willing to take back those areas and claim them for the kingdom of God. Those areas where it feels like it's hopeless, where change can't come. Those areas of injustice and persecution and oppression and hopelessness and sadness and anger and depression. It is not until we take up that mantle like Elijah did and that we are willing to go forth with courage and in boldness that's when we're going to see God work. God wants to use us as his vessels in order to move in these areas. Now, as we go through this story of Elijah, we see that God often moves in unconventional and unusual ways. This time in the wilderness that should have been a place of desolation, a place where he was starving and hungry, God actually used it to minister to him and prepare him for what was going to come. When Elijah, when Elijah was obedient in the, in the little things and, and his ear was attuned to God and he went and followed his instruction, because he was obedient in this little matter, we saw later on that God brings him such great victory in the big things. Even after this chapter, as you follow the life of Elijah, you see that he is constantly button heads with King Ahab, with his wife Jezebel. And time and time again, God brings him the victory. And, and it's always in a moment where it seems like Elijah shouldn't win. But because he was willing to surrender to God and because he was willing to go forth, he had the victory time and time again. The world right now is much like this ancient land of Israel. It's in turmoil. There is so much hate and anger, mistrust, division that is in the world around us, and for that matter, in the church. And it seems like the Baal has the power wherever we go. It seems like we don't have the authority to go forth and to speak change into these hopeless and broken situations. But I'm here to remind you guys tonight that God is bigger than COVID. God is bigger than racism but it's going to require an obedient people and an obedient church who is willing to take up that Elijah mantle and go forth and boldly proclaim the name of God, to be willing to fight against injustice, fight against oppression. 
Elijah could not stay hidden in the wilderness. He could not stay quiet or silent or still. Yes, there are seasons to be still and hear the word of God. Yes, there are seasons when we got to take a moment and think and breathe and process. But I'm here to challenge you that this is not one of those moments. This is a moment where God is calling us to go forth, to take back what the enemy has stolen, to be his agents of change, his agents who fight against evil and injustice. This reminds me of a scripture in Isaiah. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read it very quickly. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, it reads, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to, to, learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. I know that the world around us is a scary place right now. I know that many of us are feeling unsettled and unsure. But I'm here to tell you tonight that God is calling us to be Elijah's. We have work to do. The church has work to do. We have work to do as individuals. And this is only the beginning. What's going to come is God proclaiming his name all over this land. We're going to see him win victories over racism and hate. And I strongly believe that we all have a big role to play in this. So let's not stay silent. Let's not hide anymore. But let's go forth boldly and fight on behalf of those who often can't. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God. Thank you for speaking through me, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the word that you brought through me, oh God. I pray that this word will seep into the hearts of all those who listen, Lord. I know that this can be a challenging, disturbing, and crazy time, oh God, but I believe that you have a mission for us and for your church, Lord. I believe that you want us to be Elijah's who are not afraid to butt heads with those who would oppress, those who would bring evil, those who would do injustice, Lord Jesus. So, dear God, I pray, Lord, for a special spirit of courage, Lord Jesus, of boldness. We are willing to go forth and be your agents of change, Lord Jesus. I thank you and I praise you for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll see you in cruise. God bless.